Okay, thank you all so much for your patience. I think we can get started now. I hope you can all hear me well. Um, so good morning, good afternoon um, to everyone who's joining us, both in person and online. And welcome to the first session of the multi-stakeholder dialogue on cloud computing, international security, and governance. I'm afraid it's going to be uh, like fully uh, virtual per, uh, panel for our speakers, and I'm going to be the lonely one here in the podium. So please bear with us, and um, I, I would suggest you to have your earpiece um, um, all the time so that you can hear um, the online speakers. So um, my name is Wen Ting and I am associate researcher with the security and technology program at UNIDIR. Um, so this session will delve into the international security implications of cloud technologies, building on the technical presentation we have just heard from this morning's technology breakfast. So we will try to unpack the intricate relationships between cloud computing and international security, mainly um, surveying the major risks and opportunities that cloud technologies present. I'm delighted to be joined today um, online by three excellent speakers, Dr. Nana Ifani Ajufo, Professor of Law and Technology at Leeds Law School. She also serves as chair of the Cybercrime Working Group of the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, and also the vice person, uh, vice chairperson of the African Union Cybersecurity Expert Group, Dr. Ariel Eli Levite, non-resident senior fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program and Technology and International Affairs Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And last but not least, Dr. Maro Gili, Senior Researcher in Military Technology and International Security at the ETH Zurich Center for Security Studies. So thank you all so much for joining us today. We will begin with presentations from each of the speakers online, followed by a dedicated Q&A session at the end. And if you are joining us online, please feel free to raise your questions at any time via the Q&A session on WebEx. And, um, and for those of you who just joined us, please know that the event is being recorded at the moment, and uh, we will make the recording available on UniDear's YouTube channel. However, we will not publish the um, recording of the Q&A session just to encourage open dialogue. So um, let's uh, get started. And I will first turn to Nana because she will need to leave early for another meeting. So she will, um, we will only have her with us for 30 minutes of this session, and she will walk us through the evolving cyber threat landscape linked to the increased reliance on cloud computing across sectors. So, uh, Nana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ventin. I hope you can see me and you can hear me. And many thanks to you and IDEA for this invitation to join in this very important conversation. And um, I would say that I'm very delighted to look at the cybersecurity perspectives of um, cloud computing, particularly the growing prevalence of cloud computing as we know it and its impact on the global cybersecurity landscape. In more recent time and with events we've been seeing, we're seeing a lot of expanded attack surface um, because of cloud computing, where you're seeing more cyber criminals expanding significantly their work um, in terms of the fact that there is now an expanded surface by attacking cloud misconfigurations, the API vulnerabilities and the weaknesses in the cloud provider security. Um, we are also seeing a sort of increased complexity of security management where, you know, the need to navigate shared responsibility responsibility has become important, but then it's becoming more difficult to define obligations in terms of cybersecurity. So in terms of that, there is this sort of dichotomy between the state's obligation in terms of governance, the role of data laws, as well as the cybersecurity mandate of organizations if you like, of stakeholders. But more importantly, when we think about cloud computing, it's also important to look at the cybersecurity perspective of nation states and the advanced persistent threats. So because of the reliance on cloud infrastructure by governments, 
critical infrastructure sectors and global enterprises. It has made it high value target for national state actors and these advanced persistent threat groups, which mostly may be non-state actors. So they disrupt cloud activities and cause geopolitical instability through targeted attacks on cloud providers and users. We have seen immense efforts across regions, and briefly I'll touch upon Africa after this. We see the Budapest Convention, the new UN Cybercrime Treaty. And one of the questions you know, I tend to ask is, in what dimensions will that treaty relate to cloud computing, the current cybersecurity practices, the governance frameworks, and the regulations? And this is a huge challenge when we think about distributed and decentralized infrastructure. This beats traditional cybersecurity models. When we think about compliance and regulatory challenges, we are seeing more and more that because cloud computing crosses national borders, it's going to create regulatory complexities around data sovereignty and jurisdictional issues as it's already created. Governance frameworks will continue to struggle to keep up with the pace of innovation in the cloud space, leading to gaps in cybersecurity regulatory policies vis a vis the reality of. Um, of, uh, of the practices in terms of cloud computing. And of course, thinking about the GDPR, the other issue is the shared responsibility and accountability. Who will take the blame? Who would be responsible? Who will be accountable? But more importantly, incident response, which is a key tenant of cybersecurity, has been a challenge. And in Africa, um, a key problem has been data sovereignty and compliance challenges. So it's creating challenges around data sovereignty and compliance, as well as the understanding of what cybersecurity is and the cybersecurity laws. The fact that cloud providers often store data in multiple geographical locations, it's also complicating compliance. And we're seeing more and more independent data centers, you know, emanating in parts of Africa. Recently, um, a telecommunications group, Airtel, was saying it's going to fund a data center in Lagos. So we're seeing more and more of independent data centers coming up with countries in Africa trying to hold on to data sovereignty as well as compliance issues. Now to come down to Africa, uh, most times when we look at Africa in terms of cybersecurity is usually as if not much is being done. But in terms of cloud computing, I would ask that we look at the AU data framework, uh, the African Union data policy framework. Interestingly, rather than just focusing on, and I think this is an example for other regions, rather than just focus on data, if you look at that policy framework, it actually extends the ambitions to cybersecurity. So, for example, it's task nation states to develop legislations on data protection, but also to look at the AU Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. It tells states to look at developing AU cyber uh, cybersecurity strategy and establish operational cybersecurity centers, which can help in terms of data protection to establish annual innovation forums to engage in research and particularly linking um, the dynamics to digital economy. But that doesn't mean there are no challenges. And this, again, could be a lesson um, in terms particularly for the global south. Why do we see, um, where do we see most of the challenges? Where do we see the need for international cooperation in terms of cloud security in a region like Africa? The key issue is usually addressing the capacity gaps. And I do not just say this in terms of training, because most times when we think about cybersecurity capacity gaps in Africa is usually about training. And so in terms of cloud computing, how do we factor in cybersecurity and train and fill up the gaps? But then there is also the question of knowledge transfer, which I think that will be beneficial in the region. Access to advanced cybersecurity technologies, which is a key challenge for the region, but importantly as well, intelligence sharing. There is still a lack of cyber threat intelligence sharing and incident response coordination. And in terms of this, it's very important. Africa also needs to consider harmonization of regulatory frameworks, um, creating consistent legal framework to gather to, you know, to cover aspects of cloud computing, establish common cloud security standards, and facilitate cross-border collaboration. 
I also think it's important for regions like Africa to develop a cloud-specific governance model. What would that mean in terms of Africa? If you look at the African Union Cybersecurity Convention, particularly Article 26, it highlights on the need for public-private partnerships. And I think that there should be a move towards African governments, international cloud service cloud providers like Amazon Web Services, Microsoft, Google Cloud, and industry bodies to design governance frameworks that do not just dwell on strict legislation, but you know, enforces the dynamics of the data realities in Africa. So addressing Africa's specific cybersecurity challenges while also adhering to global standards. It's also important to think about strategies to build resilient cloud computing infrastructure in places like the region as we promote public private partnership and most times we hear public private partnerships in Africa without listing concretely what is important and I think there are three steps when we think of public private partnership in the context of what we are discussing invest in cloud security infrastructure develop localized cloud solutions as well as drive innovation in cyber security in that aspect and I think another thing that would help is enhancing cloud security through international standards. And there's so much happening with the Cloud Security Alliance, for example, the International Organization for Standardization. I won't go into all that because of time. But then we've seen in Africa as well, a move towards global partnerships with the International Telecommunications Union and the World Bank. These two organizations have been key. ITU has been providing technical support and guidance on cybersecurity and digital infrastructure development. They've also been helping African countries adopt secure cloud technologies. I know this for sure. The World Bank as well has been providing funding for cloud infrastructure as well as cybersecurity initiatives. Now, generally beyond Africa, I would say that a move towards a multi-stakeholder approach in this aspect would also be beneficial and why is a multi-stakeholder action critical because of the global nature of cloud services i think tackling cyber security in that context will be important so we can approach the issue through harmonized regulations standards and best practices across regions it would also mean that we can reduce fragmentation and ensure sort of a coordinated global response to the cyber threats that are unique in terms of cloud computing. And I say this because, you know, the cyber security landscape is broad. It is complex, you know, when you think about what the benefits that cloud computing brings, as well as the vulnerabilities that it brings. So on one hand, the government brings the regulatory oversight, but then the private companies and users can contribute to practical security needs and innovations. So when we combine these perspectives, it will create more comprehensive and effective solutions and you know, allow us address issues from a more organized approach, even though the environment is very complex. And some of the multi-stakeholder initiatives I thought to talk about, like I've mentioned, is the Cloud Security Alliance. Um, it's bringing together industry experts, governments, and businesses to promote best practices. There are also public private initiatives like government and the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity. Um, it's something we don't have in Africa yet. But again, information sharing and analysis centers have been helping um, to help organizations better protect themselves as well as states. And as well as other standards. Now, to talk about governments as well, I think there should be more international coordination of regulatory efforts rather than making them just region specific. I think this should also tie back to the cybersecurity regulations we have. For example, the Budapest Convention, the UN Cybercrime Treaty um, that was just agreed upon, and even other regional efforts like the Malabo Convention. I think um, that is very, very important. And then finally, in terms of regional organizations, I think while we talk about international cooperation, I think regional organizations should be clear. There should be conceptual clarity in terms of their understanding of cloud computing and how to protect states across board. We've seen so many attacks in Africa recently through ransomware attacks. I think states need to look back into legislation as well as think of implementation and enforcement. I would stop there uh, because of time and I'm happy to take questions as we go on. Thank you very much. Much, Nana, for um, your fascinating presentation, and thank you for highlighting, um, you know, the vulnerabilities created by uh, cloud computing and the ongoing effort to address those. And also for thank you for sharing um, some perspectives and also experiences from um, 
Africa. So um, just to remind everyone that Nana will have to leave us um, in third, um, you know, like uh, in a minute. So basically after Eli's presentation, if you have any questions specific to Nana, please uh, make sure to um, ask them early on. So yeah, now I will turn to Eli. Um, so uh, Eli will um, shed light on the current debate surrounding the geopolitical issues of cloud computing and offer some insights into the related international security implications. Eli, over to you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to have this opportunity. And um, um, and I'm uh, even more delighted to come after Nena because I think she covered a very important ground that I will try to uh, not to duplicate. So what I'm going to do basically in the 10, 12 minutes that I've got is to do basically four things. To highlight the attributes of cloud uh, computing that I think are most pertinent for the discussion, to discuss the risks that flow from them and show how they flow from them, then to talk about the international security applications and then some thoughts about the bottom line. So with that uh, in mind, let me proceed. Okay, so the pertinent attributes, I'm not trying to cover all the attributes of cloud uh, uh, services, and I think some have already been covered, but in essence, the trend is that we're becoming hugely dependent on it. And whereas the arguments are that at the moment, kind of the uh, in consumption of IT services, only 20 or 25% uh, are actually cloud dependent, I think the trend is very clear. We're becoming totally dependent on cloud services from almost from personal life, institutional life, enterprise life, and governmental services. So that's point one. Point two, Cloud services are concentrated in the hands of a few. Uh, there was already in the previous session discussion of the road, the, the handful of uh, hyperscalers. And that is true, obviously, of the three US hyperscalers. And the same situation is actually in China. So in between, there are hardly anyone to actually mention. So second issue is concentration. The third is that cloud is no longer just a software or storage or whatever. Cloud is actually also AI and, and essentially the services that we rely on at the governmental enterprise and institutional and private life are all basically integrated into the cloud. The cloud is the platform they use for storing the data, for processing the data and so on. So we're not just uh, as, as was the case originally, mostly dependent on it for storage purposes. The fourth attribute, and you will see immediately the implication of those as I cover the ground further is the dynamism. The pace of innovation is, is literally mind boggling. And with it is also the complexity of the, of the processes involved in, in providing these kind of hyper sophisticated services. Breathtaking speed. The fifth is that we're dealing here essentially, although we're talking about cloud computing, in essence, we're dealing with fiefdoms. We're dealing here with situation which each of them is operating in and of itself, completely insular from the others. There is a very modest level of, of um, uh, um, uh, interoperability between them, uh, deliberately so for commercial reasons. And the workloads are optimized for running on one cloud or the other. So we have insularity there and no interoperability. The next issue is for business reasons, there is a lock-in phenomenon. You cannot practically switch at an affordable cost between the cloud you're dependent on. The massive <clears throat> investments that have been made in the cloud that have already been mentioned in the previous session, therefore also account for barriers to entry. The situation is not likely to change anytime soon. The next issue is there are obvious choke points in those, I'll talk about some of the risks associated with those choke points. But in essence, even though the, the, the data centers are disseminated around the world, there are many services that are only provided from one or several locations. The next issue, and, and that's one I want to elaborate a little bit further. Um, I actually, I have to switch here to, um, to a projection mode. Hold on a second. The next issue is the whole cloud services, although governments are involved, in essence, is the private sector is in the lead. As in a, con a consequence, we're dealing here with the following situations. We're dealing with autonomous corporate decision making on policy. So we have to envisage that uh, the people like Elon Musk or others 
are arbitrarily making choices on who provide, who gets services and who does not get services, or who prioritize, who is ought to be prioritized if there is a crisis and you can't supply everybody, or where you, what markets you won't go into based on individual corporate decisions. And those could be, could change over time, could be capricious, could be affected by the stockholders, could be affected by the employees, but essentially those are corporate decision-making. The next issue is that the prioritization of the services are done at the enterprise level with their business consideration. So profit maximizing and less attention to robustness, resilience, and security. Bias towards large customers, essentially building reverse leverage. So initially they try to woo you into the cloud, but subsequently you have very little leverage over the cloud provider. And clearly the, the scale and sophistication and resources available to them are also meaning they're very powerful lobbyists. So when Nena is talking about regulation, 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 and then a struggle, part of the struggle is because these guys are so sophisticated and large and, and so on. And two other issues I think they also were alluded to in the previous session. One is legitimately their perspective is the unit level, their own, not the system as a whole and its uh, uh, vulnerability or resilience or robustness and so on. And finally, people already talked about the, the opaqueness of the whole thing. So uh, Nena has already talked about the regulatory chaos, the weak government cloud and the normative lacuna. I won't cover that. So next. So the international security implications, and they all flow from my previous two slides. One, we have vulnerable critical physical infrastructure. And I'm underscoring here the word physical. So the underwater cables, the chillers, the chips, the source of energy are all vulnerable. Those are the, choke po the physical choke points of the whole thing. The second is we have become dependent not just on a physical infrastructure, but on a, on a virtual infrastructure. Basically code is infrastructure and the code is constantly daily changing. So uh, we do not fully appreciate once this mental shift from physical dependence, which still exists here, but virtual dependence on code. The third is there is a deficient resilience and robustness measures. The cloud providers are mostly focused on <clears throat> things that they see immediately profitable. And therefore their attention to how you actually overcome all of the scenarios and then rebound from them is highly deficient. The point to emphasize here are two. One, if you take a U.S. Army terminology, you have for every important function, you have four elements. You have primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency for each of those. That doesn't exist in the cloud. Furthermore, while the cloud providers do put some emphasis on the fact that they could be able to resume service quickly, that's not the emphasis on the, cl on the uh, clients being able to recover quickly. There is a huge gap between these two factors. The third is they are trying to make security a commodity. So you actually pay more, you get more security. You pay more, you get more. So if they don't bake in security, highest level of security, they're saying you want it, pay for it clearly create some kind of a, 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 a kind of a suboptimal results. And because this is both infrastructure and virtual and concentrated and, and, and uh, uh, such level of dependence, insurance is hardly available. Very limited availability of insurance. The next issue is there is enormous uncertainty about the reliability. There are numerous unknowns. And the, the numerous unknowns are even to the providers in part, not only because things are changing so diff so quickly and things are so complex because they are so costly and time uh, 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 demanding to, 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 stimulate, to simulate and to test them regularly. So it doesn't really happen. They're very localized and small things, but that's not surprising that therefore you have those big systemic events because those are very difficult, you know, as we have seen uh, uh, recently. Cloud services, I think it was already alluded to, are valuable targets. There is a rich manual motivations to target them. It could be geopolitical competition that you want to retard your adversary or your competitor and so on. 
uh, from in terms of their economic success and the capacity to turn it into military uh, applications, but obviously also for espionage, for signaling, for retaliation, for military gains, operational military gains, and so on. There is a huge variance in terms of the possible adverse effects that you may wish to 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 um, and the points that I want to to underscore here very quickly is that you do not just looking at the thing that available or unavailable or data compromised or not compromised in terms of its confidentiality, but it's also the issues of integrity and trust are fundamental because that's the way where the recovery is the slowest. And some things are difficult to reverse, like loss of confidentiality. The uh, those who are targeting cloud have faced a sort of a significant uh, uncertainty in terms of the trickle down effects, for all the reasons that I've already mentioned above. But if they don't hesitate and attack it, you know they, the results could be unpredictable, a lot larger than they would have, uh, or different uh, parties would be affected. Um, the triage, if something happens with the cloud, is very problematic from international security perspective, because at least initially there is a presumption of foul play, and the result is some some actions may be taken based on a false premise, ignoring the fact, or at least initially be sort of belittling the possibility that there would be natural disaster, human error, um, engineering failure, technical failure, and so on, that has actually caused triggered the whole thing. And finally, and not least in terms of the international security implications that I would mention, is when I heard some countries, uh, including some very large and important countries in the international system, uh, discussing the cloud and similar digital services, the point was that because they do not benefit, like others, from the dissemination of the benefits associated with the cloud, why should they support or go along with that kind of a system with others are ripping them off, not just financially, but in terms of the other benefits of cloud services and so on, which creates for them an even greater uh, motivation to target uh, digital services. So finally, let me um, let me close. Just a second. I for some reason I can't get to my next slide. Hold on a second. Oh God. Okay. So the bottom line is we're facing huge uh, painful trade-offs here. There are, on the one hand, incredible benefits that come from cloud migration and cloud dependence. You don't have to have on-prem services with all the technical and financial requirements, or at least keep them very small. Uh, the cloud services are very sophisticated, efficient, agile. Um, you can actually benefit if you're a country like Ukraine that has been targeted in terms of a digital infrastructure, migration to the cloud was a godsend in terms of uh, safeguarding some of its assets and so on. It's, there is a global presence of these cloud services and so on. We could debate the cost issues, but at least initially the cost is, is, um, is an advantage over time. That's a, a hell of a lot depends on the configuration and the kind of uh, optimization that you do, but it could be advantageous from a, a cost. And to the extent that for commercial reasons, cloud providers have actually done uh, the things that Nena was talking about in terms of spreading their wings to other parts of the world, there is democratization of access rather than focusing on the countries that are actually where the hyperscalers are located. So all of these benefits and alongside exposure to unprecedented systemic risks of the nature that I've already outlined. And all of this super on superimposed on this is that all of the traditional approaches, and then I had talked about many of them, all of which are valuable, are struggling to actually and sort of address profoundly the risks associated with cloud services and cloud dependency. And so the public-private par public partnership that you talked about is the only way to go, but the emphasis needs to be on the kind of a, the, what is the responsibility, and again, then I had mentioned it, of the providers to actually look after the customers. And that has been a hugely challenging area to work on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um
Eli. Um, and I find it especially interesting that you put, you know, the race um, of and opportunities of cloud computing into the broader context of international security. And um, you raised like many interesting and pertinent points, and um, I've taken a lot of notes personally. Um, so, uh, so for now, I think I will just go back to Nana for a second. And sorry, uh, I'm really sorry, Maro, uh, who is still patiently waiting for us online. So Nana will unfortunately have to leave um, in a few minutes. I just want to and see I can, if, if I can wait for Maro, please. Okay. So, so you can um, still uh, wait for a few more minutes. Yeah, I'm just trying to see if there's any question for Nana in the room. Not yet. So I am going to ask my question away. Uh, so Nana, um, actually, um, you talk a lot about the you know the vulnerabilities and risks that um, cloud computing can present in the context of um, you know cybersecurity. And um, so uh, I wonder what was are some of the good news, let's say. Um, so what are some of the upsides uh, you have seen um, the technology can bring to cybersecurity? And in what ways can cloud computing actually enhance the cyber resilience of a user, which can be an individual, an institution, a national government, to name just a few? Thank you. Thank you so much, Renton. Sorry for, I was trying to say that I could actually wait for uh, Myra to go, um, but I will tackle this and I wanted to say thanks to Eli as well, to hearing his presentations, of course, his presentation, it touches so much on the upside. I think the key question we also need to ask in terms of the question you've asked, Renton, is why are states? Because most times when you think about cloud computing, you know, most times it's usually sort of an organization thing. It's more of a business, you know, associated discussion, businesses, customers. But then we're seeing states going into this. And then the key question is, what does this mean for national security for states? What does it mean in terms of national cyber security for states? What does it mean for international cooperation in the context of cyber security governance for states? And they are huge. So of course there are benefits, and that is why we need to ask why exactly are governments and institutions looking at this. And one of them is critical infrastructure. You know, we are seeing more attacks on state critical infrastructure, critical information infrastructure. And why is it that states are taking advantage of cloud computing? Because in many instances, it helps to address those challenges to scale infrastructure and ensure minimal service disruption. We've seen so much in terms of distributed denial of service attacks. There was so much in Kenya um, last year where it shut down um, government institutions, um, e-data services, even this year. And, you know, there are those benefits that come with cloud computing. For example, the critical national services like the health, the finance, the security sector, they can be restored back quickly in terms of disaster recovery as a service, which is something cloud computing offers, the disaster recovery as a service solution. It provides quick recovery of data. And I think that in terms of cyber attacks um, for states, this is one of the reasons that it makes it beneficial for governments. The other one in terms of the upside is the advanced threat detection and the security tools that are built in security services like the intrusion detection systems, firewalls, malware protection, and the real-time threat monitoring. I've seen so many governments um, take advantage of this. And then I know I'm taking some time. If you look at the African landscape, a huge challenge for the region is identity management. And this has been a discourse even in terms of the digital transformation strategy for Africa. How do we get identity management across the region very seamless? We have a huge refugee population in places like Ethiopia, how do we take advantage of this? So you see that the features such as the multi-factor authentication systems, the role-based access control, it helps to enhance identity management security. And so governments as well think about this in terms of sensitive governmental um, information, sensitive governmental coordination, as well as collaboration and information sharing for cybersecurity, it's also beneficial. So I'll just end by saying that when we think of the upsides, they are there. We 
we know they are there, but we still need so much of international coordination, collaboration, international partnership, and an ability to share information and coordinate responses at a global level, not just at a national or regional level. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nana. I know you're running out of time, so I will let you go. Thank you once again for joining us um, today. So uh, last but not least, I will now um, turn to Maro. He will help us understand how the defense sector is currently adopting uh, cloud computing solutions, along with some of the uh, potential challenges and risks uh, involved. He will also highlight the role of uh, cloud computing in advancing AI-enabled military capabilities. So Maro, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Can you confirm that you, you can hear me and see the slides? Yes, everything is working uh, from, from our side. Perfect, uh, because I've put the full view, so I don't have any <coughs> uh, video feed feedback. So if something comes up, please, please uh, speak up. Uh, well, thanks for the invitation. Thanks to, the, to Nena uh, and to Eli for the very interesting presentation. Uh, in particular to Eli, because he allowed me to skip something I wanted to discuss uh, since he has already covered it and way better than I would have, uh, namely the integration between cloud computing and other services, in particular artificial intelligence. This is a key aspect that is often forgotten when we talk about cloud computing. There is a tendency to consider it only just data storage, but that actually is no longer the case and it has not been uh, the case for, for a while now. So it's very important to understand how cloud computing and artificial intelligence, namely uh, machine learning in particular, are really part of the same, two sides of the same coin. And just one aspect, so I'm very sorry, I cannot be there physically. I, I'm in Zurich, so my plan was to come by train, but I've not been feeling well since uh, last week and I'm not still feeling 100%. So if I say something that is not very clear, apologies and feel free to jump in and ask me to repeat. I'll try to be as uh, clear as possible though. Okay, so just uh, uh, we have er heard a lot about artificial intelligence over the past at least 15 years about the threat that it poses for international security about uh, machines like autonomous systems, uh, lethal autonomous systems, so-called killer robots, uh, and much more. And I don't need to uh, go into this detail. I mean, you, you only dear know these uh, debates even better than I do. But this is just to say that there has been a lot of attention about artificial intelligence and international security. But as uh, I was saying earlier, there's uh, kind of uh, there's there's been some neglect for the role of cloud computing and the military sector, both production and employment of military sector. And this is a problem because, as I was saying, uh, cloud computing is an integral part of uh, artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is about data analytics. And so you need to be able to uh, have access and keep improving your uh, your data so as to improve your algorithms. Now, when it comes to uh, the military domain, uh, there are some risks, and there are many. And here in my presentation, I will follow. I will focus on three in particular that comes from the reliance on cloud computing, and these come from the possibility that. Uh, your algorithms cannot be perfected if for some reason access to the cloud is no longer possible, whether in terms of data uploading or data downloading. Uh, the fact, and this is the second point, that if you do not have access to the most updated type of data, then you are rely, your algorithm is going to rely uh, on potentially obsolete data. And these two problems, so unperfected algorithms and unavailable data, become even more important because in the military domain, in comparison to any other domain, we have adversarial interference. That is uh, what in war, military experts generally call the measure countermeasure dynamic. That is your adversary or the, uh, the different parts fighting one against each other have a strong incentive for deception. And so this opportunity for deception becomes um, augmented when you cannot, your algorithm cannot take into consideration that your enemy, so-called, has a vote. So it can try to manipulate how your system works. 
So let me go in detail. So we have heard a lot about artificial intelligence. There's an article that came up in the spring about Israel using uh, lavender for identification of Hamas uh, terrorists. Um, same thing, artificial intelligence played a huge role in the successful um, interception of uh, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, and drones by Israel like one month later because um, the, the capacity of detect, identify, and track missiles strongly rely on machine learning. Uh, of course, artificial intelligence and machine learning have played a big role also in the Russian-Ukraine war. Uh, so in, again, for uh, detection and identification, of course, when you any time you shoot at the target at long range, you always face a key problem, namely, you do not, you cannot visually identify the target as a target. You are relying on a system that tells you that that flying object or a ground object is in fact an enemy. And this is why uh, big data and signal processing, uh, advanced signal processing, that is machine learning is extremely important. And so far here is the same point. Again, machine learning playing a very important role also for ground targets. And of course, uh, also the capacity of detect minor changes in on the ground, and these minor changes again to big data and machine learning can provide a key advantage. Just over the weekend, there was an article uh, in the Financial Times discussing exactly this aspect about how one of the key advantages of Israel against uh, Hezbollah, for example. Uh, so just to provide another example, this is relevant also for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so a couple like. Two years ago, I think a paper came up that provide a huge data set uh, created by Chinese researchers that uh, uh, includes all a very broad range of U.S. ships with key details of these ships that allows a, an algorithm to identify uniquely identify those ships, not only to the class they belong, but also to very specific ship which has, of course, obvious implication for war fighting in the Indo-Pacific. And the U.S. is the same type of system that is a missile that can carry out this identification and also identify the weakest point of a ship that it can strike. Now, where it does this all lead to? It leads to the importance of data. And to explain it, I rely on a technology that most of you, at least the youngest people, among us, I'm not young anymore, so I want to emphasize, uh, no, and it is Shazam. So Shazam is a sensor, like it's pretty much like sonar, that helps identify a song that you hear in the background. So by activating it, it allows you to tell you, okay, with 99% probability, this is this song by this singer. Well, how does Shazam work? Shazam works because it has a huge library of songs with which it can match so to identify the pair and tell the, the owner of the phone, this is the song you are listening to. And to do it, not only it has this huge library of songs, but it has also like the algorithm improves every time you use it. Because of course, once you, you want to know the song in a very crowded and loud bar, another time you want to hear it at the train station with trains arriving. So there are all these disturbances. And so the algorithm get automatically perfected in what in signal processing is called distinguishing signal from noise. So this is very, very important. So the more data you have, so anyone with background in statistics know, the more data you have, the more your, you, the mean toward, tends toward the real mean and uh, the standard errors decrease. So you increase the probability of distinguishing again, signal from noise. And this is just a graph of usage of Shazam uh, in a city. Well, what is the problem? The problem, as I was saying earlier, is that uh, in warfare, your enemy has a vote, so it can take countermeasures. So your enemy is not going to wait for you to accumulate a large stock of data of its systems, whether it's ships, aircraft, you name it, missiles, uh, so that you can increase the probability of interception. It's going to introduce countermeasures of very different type, whether it's a physical countermeasure that is changing the shape of the, some of these ships of aircraft, camouflaging some of them as civilian uh, ships, for example, or electronic countermeasures of different types. And so this is, becomes a very serious problem when you rely on cloud computing for when your um, uh, systems, like whether radar systems, sonar systems, you name it, rely on cloud computing. Because if you have not been able to update your 
uh, your library of data, then your system, and in order to include the adversarial countermeasures, then you are relying on an old stock of data. Uh, similarly, if you are not able to have access to cloud computing, you are relying on edge computing. That is, think about if you are uh, offline and you are looking within your, whether it's your Facebook profile or Twitter profile, assuming it can work, is going to rely only on those information that has been saved. So again, you are relying on a, an old stock of data. And then, of course, these uh, discrepancy between what you think you're doing and what you're actually doing can pose a very serious threat, especially if the key assumption of the operator is that the system is extremely effective and is extremely reliable, because this is a key, a key problem. If the operator knows that there are some limitations, then it might be more uh, attentive to potential problems. But if the operator believes that what he or she is doing is actually 100% um, verified and bulletproof, but it's not, then this can lead to problems. Uh, and this is just a, uh, an idea how this kind of measure and countermeasure applies to the um, military domain, but there are also examples in others. So this is uh, James Simpson, a billionaire uh, investor. He died earlier this year. And so he understood this dynamic. So he was one of the first investors that uh, decided to rely on uh, sig like signal processing, that is distinguishing signal from noise for his investments. And he understood that his investment strategy needed to include an approach so as to deceive the competitor. So he wanted to make sure that uh, no competitor could understand the patterns of his investments and therefore introduce some noise to avoid that. And this is just to provide you with the, the idea that is behind what I was saying. So I'll stop here. And uh, again, if I've not been uh, clear, please uh, let, I'm happy to explain better uh, a given point. Uh, So much, uh, Maro, for your presentation. Thank you for highlighting um, the various uh, concrete military applications and also uh, the potential uh, risks and benefit of the technology. So we are quite short on time. We only have ten minutes left for the uh, for this session. Um, I will just hold on with my moderator privileges to ask questions and turn to the room and also online attendees to see if you have any questions for um, Eli and Maro. And please also know that we are not going to publish the recording of the Q&A session. So please feel free to ask your question openly. To thank all of our speakers um, again, Nana, Eli and Maro for their insightful contributions today. And thank you also uh, to the participants for joining the session. We are uh, breaking for lunch uh, now, but we will be back in one hour for the final session focused on the governance implications of international security. So please um, do join us um, later. If you are here with us in, in the room, lunch will be served just outside the conference room. So please enjoy your lunch and see you soon. Thank you.